Indonesia is one of the largest archipelagic countries in the world, with more than 17,000 islands that spread over an area of more than 2 million kilometer squares. Indonesia is host to several unique ecosystems, containing a large number of diverse species. At least 10% of the world's flowering species, which counts to over 25,000 species, flourish in Indonesia. There are also 12% of the world's mammals, 16% of reptiles, 17% of birds, 6% of amphibians, and over 45% of fishes, all of which are parts of the nation slash biodiversity. In order to preserve its biodiversity, which also contributes hugely to the world, Indonesia has taken significant steps in accordance to the national and global target on biodiversity framework. The government has allocated more than 500 units of protected area spread throughout the country, with the total coverage area of 22 million hectares terrestrial and 20 million marine protected area. Because of its uniqueness and universal values, six protected areas are recognized as World Heritage Sites, 16 Biosphere Reserves, 7 Ramsar Sites, and 7 ASEAN Heritage Sites. Many studies and researches has also been conducted to identify plants and animals to assess their potential uses for medicine, food, energy, and biocontrol for a chemical hazard. Some community-driven activities such as ecotourism has also contributed to the effort to preserve Indonesia's biodiversity, which also encouraged cooperation among local stakeholders. The results are heartening. By 2019, Indonesia has been able to increase the population of endemic and priority species. Communities have also enjoyed benefits from this improved environment through ecotourism, environmental services, and other significant conditions, which contribute to their quality of life as a whole. There is little doubt that Indonesia's vast biodiversity plays a hugely significant role in reducing the impacts of climate change. By preserving its biodiversity and its ecosystems, Indonesia can help support the entire planet's sustainability and ensure a better future for all humankind. Sejarah Fakultas Kehutanan UGM resmi didirikan pada tanggal 19 Desember 1949 dan merupakan universitas yang bersifat nasional. Selain itu, UGM juga berperan sebagai pengemban Pancasila dan sebagai universitas pembina di Indonesia. Pada saat didirikan, UGM hanya memiliki enam fakultas dan salah satu di antaranya adalah Fakultas Pertanian. Dalam perkembangan selanjutnya, melalui Surat Keputusan Menteri Perguruan Tinggi dan Ilmu Pengetahuan nomor 99 tahun 1963, Fakultas Pertanian dan Kehutanan UGM terpisah menjadi tiga fakultas, yaitu Fakultas Pertanian, Fakultas Teknologi Pertanian, dan Fakultas Kehutanan. Dengan demikian, Fakultas Kehutanan UGM secara resmi dinyatakan berdiri pada tanggal 17 Agustus 1963. Dekan pertama Fakultas Kehutanan UGM adalah Profesor Insinyur Sudarwono Harjo Sudiro. Berdasarkan SK Direktur Jenderal Pendidikan Tinggi, SK Dirjen Dikti Nomor 163 tahun 2007 tentang pengaturan program studi dan surat keputusan rektor nomor 89 tahun 2010 tanggal 1 Februari 2010 mensahkan perubahan keempat program studi di Fakultas Kehutanan menjadi satu dengan nama program studi kehutanan program studi kehutanan terdiri dari empat bagian yaitu 1. Departemen Manajemen Hutan 2. Departemen Silvikultur 3. Departemen Teknologi Hasil Hutan dan 4. Departemen Konservasi Sumber Daya Hutan 
Di Fakultas Kehutanan terdapat Dewan Perwakilan Mahasiswa atau DPM yang berperan sebagai Badan Legislatif Mahasiswa dan Lembaga Eksekutif Mahasiswa atau LEM. Kemudian terdapat empat himpunan mahasiswa minat, di antaranya yaitu Keluarga Mahasiswa Manajemen Hutan atau KMMH, Himpunan Mahasiswa Budidaya atau Himaba, Family of Forest Product Technology atau Forest Tech, dan Family of Forest Conservation atau Forestation. Di samping itu, terdapat Badan Semi Otonom atau BSO yang meliputi Organisasi Pencinta Alam atau Mapala Silva Gama, Komunitas Seni Kehutanan atau KSK, Keluarga Mahasiswa Islam Kehutanan atau KMIK, dan Forestry Study Club atau FSC. Sedangkan International Forestry Student Association atau IFSA dan Keluarga Mahasiswa Kristen Kehutanan atau BONITA termasuk ke dalam non-BSO. FFI bekerja di Indonesia sejak tahun 1996, yaitu awalnya bersama dengan LIPI untuk melakukan penelitian-penelitian, terutama penelitian terkait dengan harimau Sumatera. Kemudian berkembang, kemudian kita ada kerjasama dengan Kementerian Lingkungan Hidup dan Kehutanan, waktu itu Kementerian Kehutanan, terkait dengan pengelolaan spesies-spesies yang dilindungi. Tantangan terbesarnya adalah kata kuncinya sebenarnya kepedulian. Ya, kata kuncinya adalah kepedulian. Kalau semua sudah peduli, maka secara umum sebenarnya pekerjaannya sudah dan. Tapi masalahnya itu, bagaimana kita mendorong semua pihak untuk peduli menyelamatkan planet kita ini bersama-sama. Itu tantangan yang paling besar. Kearifan lokal masyarakat juga sangat penting di sana. Jadi di lain pihak kita melihat ada ancaman, tapi di lain pihak juga kita melihat ada kearifan masyarakat untuk menjaga hutannya. Nah itu yang kita coba untuk dorong untuk dikembangkan. Planet kita ini yang sustain, sustaining the planet itu jangka panjang paling panjang kita. Jadi itu tujuan jangka panjang keberadaan MFI. Bukan hanya di Indonesia, tapi di dunia. Hello and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Selamat siang kepada Bapak, Ibu, dan rekan-rekan yang saya hormati. Welcome to the fifth symposium of the Wildlife Ecology, Conservation, 
and Management International Conference, or WECMIC. Before we start, please allow me to introduce myself. My name is Faiha Azkaya Zahira, and you can call me Faiha. I'm currently a second year student in the Faculty of Forestry, Universitas Gajah Mada. It is truly my honor to be your master ceremony for this important event. In this fifth symposium, we will be discussing with the theme of the role of ex situ conservation to prevent wildlife extinction, including captive breeding, long-term rehabilitation for non-releasable animals, policy, and regulation. First, let us send our deepest gratitude to God for his blessings and his mercy, so we can attend and participate in this session, which is the expert talk session in a good condition. I would like to welcome again, Mr. Anus Meinata as our chair for this session, as well to our honorable speakers. Ladies and gentlemen, in this session, we will have five speakers who will be joining us. First, we have our keynote speaker, Dr. Steve Unwin from the University of Birmingham, followed by Dr. Muhammad Agil from the Faculty of Veterinary Institute Pertanian Bogor. Next, we have Professor Dr. Radin Wisnu Nurcahyo from Universitas Gajah Mada. We also have Dr. Ahmad Munawir from the Javan Hawk Eagle Sanctuary Center, Halimun Sala National Park. Last but not least, we have Dr. Susan Chain from Borneo Nature Foundation and Oxford Brookes University. To lead the expert talk, please allow me to read the guidelines for this session. For each expert talk's participant is scheduled for 20 minutes for the presentation, except for keynote speakers who will have 30 minutes for their presentation. For this, please check up your agenda. Second, the questions and answer sessions will be held at the end of the session. Third, a technical briefing will be held three days before the presentation at 7 to 8 p.m. GMT plus seven time. Last, please check your email regularly for updates of the meeting link. Ladies and gentlemen, this session will be chaired by Mr. Anus Meinata. Mr. Anus Meinata or Mr. Anus is a master's student in the Faculty of Forestry, Universitas Gajah Mada. He finished his education degree as a Bachelor of Forestry, Universitas Gajah Mada, Indonesia in 2019. <laughs> Mr. Anus has excelled himself for various professional experiences, one of which is becoming a forestry researcher in Universitas Gajah Mada since August 2017. As forestry researcher, Mr. Anus conducts field surveys, biodiversity assessments, drafts project proposals, and makes reports for the projects in various areas all across Indonesia and overseas. Mr. Anus have assisted projects in central Kalimantan, northern Sumatra, Lampung, Philippines, and others. Up until now, Mr. Anus has published five papers concerning plant biodiversity and research. Now, Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I would like to invite the chair for this session. Mr. Anos, the time is yours. Okay, thank you so much, Faiha, for the introduction. Good morning, good afternoon, evening for everybody. I feel honored to be here and thanks to the committee for giving me the opportunity. Welcome again, honorable speakers and attendees, the fifth symposium of the WECMIC 20 and 21. The role of active conservation to prevent wildlife extinction including captive breeding, long-term rehabilitation for non releasable animals, policy and regulation. And we are here now, the last session of the expert talk series in WECMIC 2021. Today, in this session, we have outstanding speakers from all around the world who pave the way and devote conservation as part of their life. Actually, the conservation is a technique of conservation of all level of biological diversity outside their natural habitats through different techniques like zoo, captive breeding, aquarium, botanical garden, gene bank, and we will gain insight about the knowledge today right here and right now. And therefore, disseminate this topic to the public, including academicians, researchers, government, and all conservation practitioners means that we are strengthening one of the last frontier of the conservation. And let's get in. We have five speakers today, as the agenda book told us, and Vaiha told us also. Dr. Steve Unwin from the Birmingham University. We have Dr. Muhammad Agil from Veterinary Faculty, IPB University. 
We have Professor Raden Wisnu Nurdayo from Veterinary Faculty, Universitas Gajah Mada. Next, we have Mr. Ahmad Munawid MSc from Japan Hope Eagle Sanctuary Rehabilitation Center under the management of the Halimun Sala National Park. And in the end of the agenda, we have Dr. Sushi Shine, the co-director of Borneo Nature Foundation, as well as also teaching fellow in the Oxford Brook University. Okay, now we have all speakers already here in the room, and thank you for all speakers being here on time. And please have your seat virtually in the discussion session. All right. The first in our keynote speakers, Dr. Steve Unwin, and currently teaching as a full-time lecturer in a biosystem and environmental change school of bioscience in Birmingham University. He was the orangutan advisory group for Chester Zoo. He had a lot of professional experience about conserving the wildlife along with his researches and publications. And he will give us a great presentation about the topic entitled Active to Conservation and Preventing Extinction Myth versus a Reality. Just by reading the title, I just had a goose bump in my shoulders. So just describe, describe it's great. So uh, Dr. Steve Unwin, are you here with us? Yes, I am. Thank you, Alnus, for that. Um... I don't know how I can live up to that introduction, but um, uh, but, but thank you to you and the um, and the team at WECMEC for inviting me to give this keynote. So uh, it's a great honor. All right, Dr. Steve, just in case I did a mistake in my introduction, please just be comfortable to add your introductions. So that's probably would be totally okay. And since, okay. <laughs> and since your mic and also video is totally great, and without further ado, now the stage is yours and you have 30 minutes. Go on, Dr. Steve. Thank you very much, Ross. Okay, first technical challenge is sharing screen. So hopefully you can see um, hold on, my title page there. So um, thank you for that, as I said, very much for that um, uh, uh, um, introduction. It's quite embarrassing. Um, but one thing that Alnus didn't mention is that I'm actually a wildlife veterinarian um, as, as well. And so my talk today, um, uh, looking at the um, basically the role of zoos, wildlife rehabilitation centres, or pretty much any um, uh, situation where humans and non-human animals, especially with we're talking about wildlife, come into contact with each other. And as a wildlife veterinarian, I'm particularly interested in um, sort of disease transmission between different species. Obviously, the current pandemic we're working in is a zoonotic infection. And because of my previous experience in, um, in zoos in, in several countries, as well as rehabilitation centers, including in, in Indonesia and Malaysia, I wanted to give a little bit of context as to aspects of um, that human wildlife interface and uh, maybe a few processes that we work on uh, uh, with, within um, medical fields, um, but also from an ecology point of view, um, uh, how we can make situations better and what roles um, zoos and wildlife uh, and rehabilitation centers have in that. But first off, I would like to introduce you to my co-star here. This is um, Tuti. And Tuti is um, a uh, Sumatran orangutan um, born and raised here in the UK at, uh, at Chester Zoo. And Tuti was, um, uh, and when this photograph was taken um, several years ago, uh, was uh, three and a half years old. And uh, he wasn't being asked to poke his tongue out, but he was being asked to show um, his upper incisor teeth. And this is an instance of where hopefully in situ and ex situ research can sort and can come together because uh, until the very recent past in the last couple of years it was not possible to accurately identify the age of uh, of young orangutans especially and um, uh, so this was a, um, a research project that was done in conjunction with um, various projects in Malaysia um, and the person who was heading it was a lady called Felicity Oram and she was um, helping the Sabah Wildlife Department at the time accurately uh, assess the age of young orangutans that were involved in human wildlife conflict situations to make sure that animals were being moved at a correct time. Now, with Tuti, because he was born in a zoo, we obviously knew when he was born. And so we could say his precise age and be able to tell with those teeth um, how old he was, because there was concern that animals were being um, uh, suggested that they were older than they actually were. And so uh, uh, this turned out to a more accurate sort of uh, way to 
uh, understand what the age of the animal was and then be able to say, okay, this animal needs to go to rehabilitation or this animal can be translocated to another wildlife area or wild area or, or what have you. So it's an indication of where um, uh, zoos globally can help inform wildlife management in situ by being able to gather information that would be otherwise impossible in the wild to be able to help those wildlife management decisions. So that's sort of like an, an initial sort of um, indication of what good are zoos and rehab centers. So I'm going to spend the first couple of slides talking about um, uh, a couple of um, uh, paradigms in which we work, uh, and then uh, the rest of the talk will be um, uh, with examples of, um, uh, what, of how we can overcome these challenges at this human wildlife interface. So as a species, as a primate species, we um, evolutionary wise have uh, are often bound with how we see the world and what we can um, actually do about it and what uh, as we, we, became, we usually become very focused on what's in front of us. So this is a little bit of a silly take basically on what is what we saw the, the wicked challenges within the environment around us. And although um, we are aware of the issues of climate change and the bigger issue coming behind of biodiversity collapse um, and economically the possibilities of global recession, when we're dealing with something that, that is uh, as a pandemic such as COVID-19 from SARS-CoV-2, uh, as a society, we concentrate on what's immediately in front of us and say, this is terrible, this is, this is a, a global disaster, why can't we work together properly? And although maybe intellectually we understand the bigger waves that are coming behind it, we, oft, we need help in being able to formulate how we're going to manage these things. And so at the human wildlife interface, especially when we're doing some, dealing with something large such as biodiversity collapse, we need to have tools that can help us uh, articulate what needs to be done in the world. And one of those paradigms is this um, idea of one health. Now, I'm sure many of you have got an understanding of, um, of this, it's like an, where it's a combination, where human health, animal health, and environmental health merge together and where there is interconnections, that is where One Health is and operates. But this uh, view of it from the CDC, I actually prefer because it focuses on the ecological underpinnings of what One Health is all about. It's not a medical thing. So hopefully, I, and I suspect all of us are people who want to protect human, animal, and, and healthy environments, healthy ecosystems. But we do that by coordinating, communicating, and collaborating with each other. And that's why I like this, um, this particular slide, is that it shows that by interdisciplinary work and research, by working together with different organizations, academia, research organizations, uh, industry, as well as zoos and wildlife centers that work on that human wildlife interface, and by all working together with our different um, uh, expertise, we're able to better achieve the health out outcomes for people's animals, plants, and the environment environment. And so to me, as a, um, uh, as a human, as a storytelling ape, this tells the story of why uh, and how a process such as One Health can help us improve the ecological outcomes of the, of the planet. And One Health um, is traditionally seen through the eyes of either my, ourselves as veterinarians or through medics. Um, I know um, UGM um, is home to the um, Indonesian One Health, uh, University One Health Network, for example, Indahun. But I'd like to postulate the idea that to have healthy ecosystems, you need to understand what a healthy ecosystem is, and that means ecology. And you also need to understand how, how society operates within that ecosystem, and that means working uh, in uh, the humanities and sociology. And, but because I'm a vet, we need to talk a little bit about how the disease and, and zoos and rehabilitation centers interact with humans and other animals uh, to potentially sort of um, to spread disease. And this slide is from a, um, a, an International Union of Conservation and Nature manual, the IUCN manual on wildlife disease risk analysis. And I just wanted to draw your attention to how within our environment, here's the natural environment, nothing is outside the natural environment, including us as humans. And what that means is fundamentally from an ecological basis, we humans are a part of nature. It's not an either or. 
obviously we are the dominant mammal on the species on, on, on the planet and so this human modified landscapes account for about 75 percent of the land mass within the natural environment and because we are so um, uh, we, we have altered the um, uh, the world around us so much then interaction between wildlife there's peri-domestic wildlife what we call urban wildlife um, uh, that we share our lives with our domestic livestock and ourselves as humans, there are more and more opportunities and chances for, in this instance, diseases to, and, and pathogens to, or pathogens to move between different populations. But also on the wider ecological sort of framework, we have to understand how humans operate within the environment from a sociological point of view as well, for us to be able to manage any of these um, uh, large situations. So when you're looking at a zoo or a wildlife rehabilitation center, whether it's in Indonesia or here in the UK or in Kenya or wherever it happens to be, where we operate is between wildlife and peri-domestic wildlife and, and human. And by showing this as a wider systems view, hopefully we can contextualize that in a way that uh, makes us understand that uh, we can't do this alone. We have to be able to work together in a wider framework. So that's it with some of the con uh, concepts, but I also want to highlight, uh, again, from an ecological point of view, how we have um, different interactions with wildlife all the time. Now, this um, is my local shopping center up the road, um, and I was uh, rather naughtily sitting in the car um, eating a hamburger, and these are wild starlings coming in, and uh, there's obviously they've been trained or taught to be able to interact with humans in this sort of situation in the hope of finding food and they see us as, so even in this relatively benign experience and situation our the opportunity for us to interact with other species within an environment is high and we're potentially changing their behavior and therefore changing their ecology just to be clear i did not offer um, the birds any 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 of my food but again they have been trained by people to say that this is a good food source and we can then start to look at from a health point of view whether that is actually best for um, that population of particular birds to contextualize it maybe in a little more of a um, uh, uh, Southeast Asian context. I took this photograph um, uh, 10 years ago now in Bukit Lawang. Um, and uh, here, obviously, you can see a group of international tourists. Um, most of them came from um, the, uh, uh, Europe, but a few from the USA. Here we have a juvenile male orangutan who had gone through a rehabilitation process and um, had recently been released. And uh, the situation now is totally different. This, 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 this no longer occurs, but I use this photograph to show the potential interaction between human and non-human animal, in this case, an ape. And from a veterinary perspective, in this interface for an animal that has gone through a rehabilitation process, I'm seeing this um, uh, young orangutan as potentially threatened by these people because of the potential diseases they have brought with them from wherever they've come from. All of them um, had been traveling on a plane within the previous 24 hours. And as we know, there are a lot of diseases that go backwards and forwards between ourselves and other animals. Um, but most of the evidence um, uh, globally shows that it's actually the wildlife that is more at risk from us. Now, also, um, what I'm also seeing here is a load of happy people looking at an animal that they never thought they'd actually be able to see in the wild. So this is from the sociological side, this is an ideal education opportunity to discuss with these people now that they've sort of engaged with wildlife, um, uh, not to say that they are a threat to this young orangutan, but that um, uh, sort of start to consider that they're more open to discussions about both the good and the bad things that this photograph um, uh, could engender. So it's an ideal, um, it's best to educate people when they don't realize they're being educated. So sticking, coming back now to zoos specifically, um, uh, the um, zoos here in the UK are usually members of the European Association of Zoos and Aquaria, just as those in Southeast Asia are part of CESA. And I just want to draw your attention under the European conservation standards that it is a requirement of zoos in Europe to engage in and support conservation endeavors that contribute to the long term survival of species in natural ecosystems and habitats and allocate appropriate resources to such endeavors um, as what they may be. Oops, I shouldn't have done that. My, my apologies. Bear with. 
right? So um, that begs the question, how do they do that? And do they live up to expectations? Also, that is an extremely vague um, uh, statement to engage and support endeavors for the long, how do they, how can they assess the impact of that long-term survival? Well, I think it's important as a starting point to say that the European zoos since 2016, following the conservation strategy um, uh, to be a member of the Yaza have to comply with these standards. Now we're here in, well, I, I'm, I'm here in, in the UK, and so there is a British and Irish Association of Zoos and Aquaria, and they, um, again, linking in with the IASA, and number six here, to act in accordance with the ideals and goals of modern zoos articulated, and to actually work within the framework that is um, set out by IASA. I'm sorry about that, I shouldn't do this. Okay, so, um, and on here on the, um, uh, the, on the other side is the American Zoo Association, and they actually start to bring in welfare considerations as well. And uh, as a, both a welfareist and a conservationist, I see that as, they're often kept as separate, um, but I, I prefer to see them as a continuation um, uh, of, um, uh, of, of a, of a pro 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 program. The other thing to maybe bring your attention to is that um, world zoos and the, the, the world zoo community actually, when it comes just to straight money, um, uh, provides um, a large contribution to conservation globally. Uh, this is a little bit of out of date now. I think that the figure now is closer to um, uh, th um, close to 600 million. But you can see here um, uh, globally after the Nature Conservancy and WWF that as a community, um, uh, they, uh, the zoos are a large donor to conservation in the wild. And I'll provide some uh, examples and, and evidence of that um, uh, going forward. Mm -hmm. The other thing I wanted to um, sort of look at is that the, the, the new, the global strategy of zoos look in this one plan approach. So this is from an education as well as a conservation point of view. And global zoos have a responsibility to link what is going on ex situ. And that means um, if we're dealing with orangutans here in the UK um, or orangutans at Jakarta Zoo, for example. So they are both ex situ situations the one in Indonesia just happens to be uh, in a range country, right through to what is happening in situ, so working with animals in the field um, and, 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 and uh, in the wild. And so zoos have a duty to develop and adapt intensive wildlife management techniques for use in protecting and pres preserving species in nature. And that is the same goal as any other sort of wildlife um, uh, or any other conservation or landscape conservation project. And I just want to point out the bottom one there is to provide ethical and moral leadership in, in, in being able to do this. So this is linking them to an integrated species conservation strategy. So you link what is going on in situ with what is ex situ. And that is the goal of every zoo that is a member of the World Association of Zoos and Aquaria. How they actually do that and whether they uh, are successful at doing that, of course, that is up for debate, but I would like to show you some, share with you some uh, examples where that may actually be, um, be occurring. So how does that work in practice though? And uh, so these are um, images uh, from Chester Zoo, where, who is my um, former employer, but also um, uh, showing support for organizations such or, or networks such as the Orangutan Veterinary Advisory Group, um, uh, which I'm involved with uh, in Indonesia and Malaysia. So this one plan approach and practice brings together what's going on within your facility, within the zoo, and what your zoo is doing in the field. And whether it's um, money, um, whether it's breeding animals in captivity. I'm sorry, I don't know, I'm, I'm not changing that. Um, I think it's sort of a set time, so apologies for that. Uh, the scientific research, um, uh, whether you are doing, having projects that are involved in re reintroduction or at the very least translocation of um, animals in the wild. Most importantly at the center of this is education and human behavioral change. Um, and that was working with partners and sort of dealing with politics of different situations and sustainability, right through down to protecting wild populations and habitats, always in combination with field partners. So a good zoo, should be able to justify their existence by proving that all of these things, both what they're doing in the zoo and in the field are joined up and uh, are, are, are being um, conducted. That's conservation, but zoos also um, are, of, are also welfare organizations as are rehabilitation centers. And so under the World Association of Zoos and Aquaria, 
and various national and regional associations. It is a requirement by 2023 that um, all organizations have an animal welfare evaluation process in place. Um, and they must, and all, all, all zoos must be compliant with this process. So an understanding that animals in captivity have welfare needs and that healthy populations in conservation are made up of individuals that also need to be healthy, both physiologically and psychologically. And zoos have an important role to play, as do rehabilitation centers when they're rehabilitating animals to go back into the wild, to make sure that um, uh, the individual animals' welfare and well-being are, are well catered for. I just wanted to take you briefly to the other side of the world now, to um, uh, Brazil. And this is a project that was um, uh, very um, uh, honored to be a, a, um, a part of, um, even, even as briefly. And this is an, uh, an example of where a zoo set up to look after an anim animals within uh, an actual ecosystem links to what is going on in the wild. So Park des Aves is a bird park uh, in Iguazu near the Atlantic rainforest in the southern part of, um, uh, of, of, of Brazil. And many people obviously understand what is going on with the Amazon rainforest, where 20% of the Amazon rainforest has, has been lost. However, there is not nearly as much media coverage of the Atlantic rainforest down the south here, where 88% of the forest has been lost. And so the, um, uh, uh, the Parc des Aves is a, is a wild park, wildlife park that um, uh, predominates with birds and is obviously open to the public and uh, is um, uh, right next to the Iguazu Falls, so it's part of a major tourism site. But their focus is um, always on this human-animal interaction, and this is a jaguar um, uh, they managed to take a photograph of as it trotted through the zoo car park. And you can see the person in the background just taking a photograph. It's all very calm and very mild. You're, this is, you're very lucky to see a jaguar in this area at all. But there's another indication where, um, of, from an educational point of view, that this was just running, this animal was just running through the zoo's car park. And that interaction, how people react to that, all comes down to um, uh, um, education, both in the moment of don't panic, um, right through, because the animal is moving through, right through to the broader context of why does this Jaguar need to run through a car park to get from one part of its environment to another, and raises all of these sorts of different questions. Now, as a zoo, Park des Aves supports many different um, uh, uh, wildlife projects, and this one is not in Brazil, it's actually in Argentina, which we traveled across the board to work with uh, this team in Argentina. And this is the extremely endangered, or critically endangered, to use the proper vernacular, um, red and green macaw. And you see they're being radio tracked in the wild. So these are animals that have been rehabilitated in captivity, supported by a zoo in another country that are now being released and, and uh, uh, sent back out into the Pantanal, into the wild. And so these animals go through training because um, understanding the eco behavioral ecology of, of birds, especially parrots, they're incredibly intelligent animals, and they have to be retrained to make them want to fly because um, flying is, is highly energetic. Uh, and uh, parrots, especially if they don't have to fly, they won't bother flying. And so part of the rehabilitation process is to get them to be able to um, uh, um, uh, fly again, so um, and then there's through that process of going back out into the wild, and here's another pair of uh, in the distance. So these birds are still being trained. Not sure if you could care that at all, but in the background, there was a uh, somebody blowing a whistle, so these animals were being part provisioned. So they were being, as they were learning to adapt back out into the wild, they were being part fed. And all of this was being in conjunction with the wildlife authorities here in Argentina, with the rehabilitation center in Argentina, and the zoo in Brazil to make sure for, for, good, uh, for good outcomes. Just to wrap up this part of the talk, um, uh, I, the, I'm heading back to um, uh, the UK again, and the other role of um, uh, zoos is to educate the people in public that they are that they are in in a way that makes them open, at least empathetic, to looking at the plight of what's going on in the world around us. Now, these two examples are from a, uh, an, ex uh, an exhibit area, again, in Chester Zoo, because that's what I'm, I'm most familiar with. Uh, the one over here on the right is um, uh, an, part of the exhibit for Sulawesi macaques. 
And the one here in the, in the main uh, um, uh, uh, image is of a, um, a, a water exhibit that is home to various types of fish and various um, species of chelonia. Both of these are trying to indicate areas of Southeast Asian um, uh, biodiversity for the people of the UK. And the idea here is being able, if we can um, try and immerse people into this understanding of not being, you know, tra traveling all the way to Southeast Asia, but then be able to see how, um, as uh, be, make these internal um, environments as complex as we possibly can, nowhere near as complex as, um, as their natural environments would be out in the wild, but then start to um, draw people in and sort of telling the story of why we should care and how this is this interconnected nature, as I was talking about at the beginning with One Health, and how these, um, uh, uh, what's going on, on out in the field. And that is also tied in, again, in this particular case, okay, so this one plan approach of um, what's going on inside the, um, uh, uh, the zoo with what's going on in a wider area. So um, Chester, um, uh, for several years, was part of a, uh, a wider IASA campaign to draw attention to um, the situation um, uh, in, in Indonesia in particular um, uh, with um, various types of Asian songbirds, including the critically endangered Java and green magpie. And this is not casting aspersions on one um, uh, cultural practice or not. It's just providing information, say, this is what's going on, and also uh, out the other side of the world, and also can help and contextualize that with what's going on in similar um, really bad situations here in the UK. Um, uh, because, um, yeah, the, certainly the UK government has got... Um, not very good track record um, of uh, um, uh, wildlife management, certainly here. And providing people that um, uh, sharing environments with other animals. This, of course, is not a, um, a species from Southeast Asia. This is a ring-tailed lemur. But figuring out whether um, what is possible um, and what is okay for these animals to be in such close contact with people um, and how it is, but largely depends on how those people act. But um, as we are a storytelling ape, we are become much more empathetic with the world around us and respectful of the world around us if we can actually interact with the world around us. As a vet, that goes a little bit against, because uh, I'm, I'm just worried about disease spread, but from a One Health approach, from an ecological approach, that is something that um, I think we really need to sort of consider is how can we change public opinion to understand that the economics of a situation, putting food on the table, is intricately linked to how we deal with the uh, world around us. And um, uh, yeah, so that's, that, that's sort of like trying to share that, at least with the British public, that idea. So I'm just going to end um, on a very um, uh, um, Indonesian, Malaysian focused example of the Orangutan Veterinary Advisory Group. Uh, this is a group of uh, heroic and amazing individuals from all over the world, but predominantly from Indonesia and Malaysia, working together to um, protect the health, welfare, and conservation outcomes for both the orangutan and gibbon species. And um, OVAG was uh, created back in 2009. The name was coming from um, our Indonesian colleagues. Um, and so although the word veterinary is in there, it is actually looking at a wider context of how we can protect these magnificent animals. And that links again back to what goes on in, in zoos. Many of you will know um, this um, lovely lady in the middle here, Nadine. Um, she works with us now as a post, um, postdoctoral um, research fellow here at the University of Birmingham. Um, Nadine is obviously Indonesian, uh, but she comes to us from Oxford University where she's been looking at the issues of tuberculosis spread in badgers in New Zealand, and, and sorry, in, in UK wildlife. And so, uh, and this is Rico, uh, who's one of our PhD students, who is also an alumni of, um, of the OVAG program. Um, um, from Aceh, and uh, Lelia, who's from here in the UK, and working together to um, uh, improve outcomes uh, for release possibilities in orangutan by studying orangutans in zoos, and then they're studying orangutans in rehabilitation centers in Indonesia to make sure that their reintroduction programs are even more successful. Because conservation is all about people. So although we may have got into conservation work in general to be uh, working closely with wildlife, um, we wouldn't need to conserve things if it wasn't for people. So we have to make it human-centric, human whatever we do. 
Now, the network of OVAG is quite um, uh, extensive internationally. I know many of you um, are here are actively involved in this, but it links then the NGOs we're looking not just at rehabil uh, rehabilitation centers, but also organizations that deal directly with um, uh, uh, wildlife and orangutan conservation zoos globally as well um, uh, from all parts of the globe um, and also academia and research and industry linking with governments as well so this is not a, a member organization this is a network of people working in the field of orangutan health and conservation using the one health paradigm uh, to improve the situation with orangutans and that is going to end on looking at how um, that, from a United Nations point of view, bringing in orangutan conservation and sustainable technologies and, um, and uh, plants and what have you to be able to link that story together to show that this is a systems level that we all need to be able to work together. And here's obviously Rico again um, uh, uh, in, the, in the wildlife rehabilitation uh, mode. So um, I'm just going to looking at some um, at time. I realised um, I think I, was, I will um, I will stop there. But uh, uh, just the, on this last couple of slides, um, uh, there we we had together with OVAG have done research um, uh, here on looking at that translocate and helping find information on the translocation of orangutans in um, uh, uh, Indonesia during COVID-19 to look at potential risks backwards and forwards. And I'll be happy to answer any questions on that sort of situation but to show it's a very, very complex situation. And that's why One Health is so important when we're working at these sort of uh, wildlife um, human interaction in, in, in interfaces to make sure that these processes are uh, um, thought about at least at the very beginning um, uh, to make sure that we minimize the risk of disease spread between different species. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Steve. That is so amazing lectures, Dr. Steve. Uh, so the access to conservation will bring us into a broader way to conserve the species, if I can recap from the presentations. And thank you for the great presentation. Again, of course, I wrote some essential points here for me to recap for the attendees, because uh, the world is facing the challenges of the COVID-19, such as recession. They also face the biodiversity collapse and how zoos and also the others, like politicians, governments, academicians, and researchers can be integrated to, to prevent the extinction to be happened. So I inviting our attendees to please send your question on the chat box to Dr. Steven right away if you have any. All right, that's the Steve. Thank you for the presentation. And I think we should move into the next speakers. All right, next speaker, we have Dr. Muhammad Agil. He's a full-time lecturer and researcher in the Department of Veterinary Clinic, the Production and Pathology Faculty of Veterinary Medicine, IPB University. He has plenty of research and publications about pathology, and today he will deliver a topic entitled Propagation Strategy to Prevent the Extinction of Critically Endangered Wildlife. I think he worked a lot in Reno's based on our short conversation before this, but let's get into the issues. All right, Dr. Agil, are you here with us? Yep, thank you. All right. Just in case I have mistake, I did a mistake in your introduction. Please just be comfortable to add your introductions in your oh, it's more All than right. enough. All right, that's right, yeah. <laughs> okay. Since your mic Thank channel, you. okay. Since your mic and video is great, so without yeah. you, did you? You have twenty minutes now. Thank you. The stage is yours. Yep. Thank you very much. So, can you see the slide? Perfect, Dr. Agil. Just you can set it into presentation uh, okay. mode. All right. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Alice, uh, for the uh, introductions. And it is a, a great honor for, uh, for me uh, to, be, uh, to be invited as a speaker in this uh, FAC Week uh, fifth. Okay, uh, today I will uh, have a, a topic on the propagation strategy to prevent the extinctions of the critically endangered, endangered wildlife. So uh, along the discussion, so I will uh, have uh, some topic that we will uh, talk about. So the first uh, topic is about the problem and risk of critical endangered to the extinctions. And then the second is the propagation strategy of the critically endangered uh, wildlife. And then the, uh, the third is about the, the use of assisted uh, reproductive technology uh, and 
biobank uh, to prevent the extinction. Okay. Uh, problem and risk of the critical endangered, endangered uh, to the extinction. So as we know that the problem of the critical endangered wildlife that we uh, always have the uh, critical endangered uh, wildlife is in the small population, which is uh, mostly isolated or it is separated and no access for genetic uh, <coughs> exchange. Yeah. On the other hand, also uh, the small population uh, will have also the so-called LA effect phenomenon <coughs> that uh, most of the individual uh, mainly they will have long time without breeding and no uh, <coughs> pregnancy. And uh, some others also uh, we found uh, has uh, unbalanced sex, sex ratio and then also we found uh, negative population growth. So what is the risk? Uh, yeah, most of the small population uh, which is uh, mostly a critical and desert species uh, is highly inbred, so they will have a to, they will have a problem with the reduced genetic variety, and also it will increase the risk of population uh, to the extinctions. Yeah. And also the uh, this uh, critical and desert species species uh, due to of this uh, reduced the genetic variety they will have a susceptible uh, to develop to develop yeah, to develop uh, of pathology organ and also difficult to uh, pregnant and also they uh, <clears throat> also uh, vulnerable uh, to this disaster and also to the disease i'm happy that uh, this uh, in the first uh, topic uh, we heard about uh, from steve about the one health so this is a part of the uh, topic that uh, will be a part of the One Health uh, issue. So uh, according to our uh, uh, publication that we collected data from uh, early 80 until uh, now, that from the captive population, especially for the Sumatran rhinoceros, as uh, the uh, moderator uh, mentioned that uh, <clears throat> I have been uh, uh, I have been involving in this uh, Sumatran rhinos uh, conservations uh, since a long time ago, since uh, 90, uh, early 90. <clears throat> so from the data that we collect, uh, more than 70 percent captive uh, population of the Sumatran rhinoceros, they have a problem with the reproductive organ pathology. And they have a problem uh, with the difficult, uh, difficulty to uh, be uh, pregnant. This is a, a part of the picture from the pathology of the reproductive organs that we found a uh, lyomyoma in the uterus and also two more in the reproductive tract. And also recently, uh, we found uh, two more in the ovary of the uh, current uh, female that we uh, rescue in uh, East Kalimantan. So, and another uh, problem is the, about the reproductive disorder in the Sumatran Reno uh, that we found uh, multisis in the uterus that this sometimes uh, it become uh, uh, difficult uh, to the animal uh, to become a pregnant due to of this uh, multiple cysts in the uterus that uh, uh, will uh, will uh, involve in the uh, making a problem uh, to the pregnancy process of this uh, species. And also, uh, as I already mentioned uh, previously, uh, we found uh, one uh, young, it says it's uh, not, not, not young at all, it is about middle age, about 20 to 21 year, uh, years old, that we uh, found uh, death in the field, and they has a lot of lyomyoma in the uterus. So this is uh, really something, uh, an issue uh, for the Sumatran rhinoceros. Uh, for instance, like the the female that we uh, or that we had it in Sabah, she's also. Uh, 
often he uh, has a problem with the bleeding uh, from the vulva. So this is due to of the uh, of the uh, tumor yeah, in the uh, vagina in the uh, cervix. So and then uh, how about the propagation strategy of the uh, critical uh, endangered wildlife? So the uh, regarding the propagation strategy uh, for uh, for us uh, that we can uh, we we can say that uh, any single critical endangered wildlife is valuable uh, to produce an offspring, embryo, and also we can uh, preserve their genetic material. So uh if people are saying that just leave the animal in the forest uh, alone and then they will die so this is uh something that uh human uh cannot do that because uh, we can we still have the uh, technology that we can preserve the genetic material and somehow some days uh in the future we can uh, produce something from that genetic material so, uh, using a reliable method, uh, we can uh, use, uh, utilize uh, any single of uh, uh, wildlife uh, that uh, we can produce new babies if they can uh, breed properly, if they still uh, reproduc reproductively cycling, and also uh, we still have a good pair, a fertile pair. Uh, to they that can breed, but if not, also we can still uh, harvest uh, a, a gamete and then we can produce an embryo uh, in vitro. Although we uh, also also we we can uh, preserve uh, gametes, uh, fibroblasts, and stem cell uh, that are all the material somehow. In the future, we can use it as a genetic material and we can uh, produce uh, an embryo and also we can uh, produce uh, later uh, new babies if we are lucky. So, so for, for the uh, future use uh, to produce an offspring, uh, we can uh, use, we can uh, uh, take a natural breeding if it's it possible. If it's not, if natural uh, breeding failed, so we can still use assisted reproductive technology. So, uh, how we can uh, deal with the natural breeding or with the assisted uh, reproductive technology? Uh, through the natural breeding, uh, somehow, for the critically endangered species. It's not as easy as we think. Uh, sometimes, uh, for instance, like the Sumatran rhinoceros, we cannot leave them to pair uh, 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 voluntary. So we have to manage it. Otherwise, that we will find another day uh, one animal will die because they are they are fighting. Therefore, uh, we have to use a technique like uh, using a proper breeding, uh, uh, determining a proper breeding time, and also we uh, for the really small number of population, we can also use uh, based on the genetic variety uh, in order that we can uh, pair them and then we can uh, do a breeding uh, to produce uh, a baby or to produce uh, uh, new offspring. So. Uh, we can use natural breeding if we have both male and female fertile. Otherwise, if we uh, don't have, for instance, the male is not fertile, so then uh, we cannot use a natural breeding. Otherwise, that we have to uh, take uh, assisted reproductive technology as part of the uh, technology that we can uh, use to, util to utilize and to maximize the uh, genetic material to produce uh, something uh, for the future. Yeah. So determining time of mating based on the follicle size. So this is what we did in the Sumatran Reno. 
So uh, we cannot leave them uh, to meet each other by uh, without any uh, assessment for the uh, to determine uh, the proper time uh, they can breed, they can meet, and then they can uh, display the courtship. Otherwise, they will uh, fight if we uh, put them not in the right time. So one. Uh, a technique that we use is uh, we are trying to uh, uh, to assess uh, the follicle development. So we have to start to breed them if the follicle dominant uh, come to the size about two centimeter. So if not, then we have uh, we will have uh, something like this. So if we put them together not in the right time. Uh, uh, from our experience that uh, uh, prop uh, formerly we use the uh, behavior observation, but uh, often uh, when we uh, put them after we see the interest between male and female, they are fighting, they were fighting. So uh, since uh, 98, I think 98, yeah, uh, we work together with our colleague from United States, from Cincinnati, uh, try to find the uh, method how we can find out uh, the proper time uh, to breed them, to bring them together and then uh, to breed. So uh, we found out that the follicle size is the uh, proper uh, parameter in order that we can breed them, we can uh, put them together. So if we put them together in the proper time, then we will have uh, this result, successful mating. And uh, the second uh, uh, choice for natural breeding is a breeding program based on the genotype assessment. Uh, this in order to increase small population heterozygosity. This is, uh, I give an example from the conservation of the California condor in the United States. Uh, in 1987, the number is uh, down to 27, and now uh, in 2017 uh, become 463. Unfortunately, from 27, they cannot uh, breed them all, so they have to assess uh, according to the genetic uh, material, genetic result, and then finally they can uh, pair them only 16 uh, individuals, so that means only eight pairs uh, that uh, they can breed because uh, some of them, they are related, they are uh, too close in the genetic uh, relationship. So the uh, a propagation uh, program using assisted reproductive, reproductive technology, uh, actually we can uh, choose many uh, technology, uh, many technique, in order that we can uh, utilize uh, this uh, technology in order that we can uh, get uh, the result for the propagation. So the artificial insemination is a simple ART, uh, but we have to have a good uh, male and female in uh, fertile condition and then the female has a uh, normal estrus, and then the uh, male, they can produce uh, uh, ejaculate or semen, or they can produce a good sperm. So this is an example uh, from what we did, uh, we have been uh, doing here in Indonesia uh, to develop the artificial insemination in Banteng, Javan Banteng. So we successfully to train uh, the uh, bull uh, to be collected uh, using the artificial vagina, and then we can train, uh, habituate the female uh, to, for the produce, uh, procedures for ultrasonography and also to do the uh, artificial insemination. Uh, fortunately, uh, we uh, now we already uh, produce three cows, uh, were already produced at the uh, Safari Park in Bogor. And another example is about the black-footed ferret in the United States. So this is also uh, in 81, uh, all nearly extinct. On the left, uh, 18 uh, ferret in the United States, and then we, they captured it all. 
and then they have a, a, a project from 1996 uh, to 2008. So they use the intrauterine artificial insemination, and now they already uh, release about uh, 4,500 uh, ferret uh, to the wild uh, using this uh, method. And uh, another uh, uh, technology is the in vitro fertilization or an intra cytoplasmic sperm injection, IVF or ICSI. So this is the uh, condition that we have to uh, follow in order that we can uh, use this technology. So we cannot use uh, the technology without uh, uh, finding the requirement. Uh, otherwise, that uh, we will fail the, uh, the the program. So an example using the ICSI is the with the Northern African uh, white rhino which uh, this uh, animal uh, was extinct 2020, just uh, last year, extinct in the wild and extinct in the uh, captivity. Uh, fortunately, uh, 2019, uh, they still have uh, three uh, Northern African red, white rhino, uh, one uh, male and two female. And then from uh, 2019 up to 2021, uh, a group of team from uh, Institute for Zoo and Wildlife uh, Research from Germany, they're working on this uh, animal and they finally, after they all died uh, last year, so they already rescue about, they can produce nine embryos. So uh, another technology that we can do, so the condition is we can use this uh, method, somatic cell nuclear transfer or cloning, this is the uh, favorite name or famous uh, name is fa uh, from England, uh, Dolly, yeah, uh, Dolly Sip. So the condition is if we cannot uh, collect any uh, good material from the gonad, from a uh, gamete cell. So we can only uh, uh, preserve the somatic cell, uh, fibroblast, and other else, and then we can uh, uh, produce a cell line from that, and also we can produce a stem cell. And then from that uh, material, uh, it's going to be uh, fun finally uh, we can uh, produce uh, individual. So it's already uh, applic applicated in the panda and also in Dolly. I think everybody uh, knew about this story uh, from uh, uh, genetic material from uh, other, individ other, in other individual and then uh, put it in the egg of uh, other uh, female uh, produce egg, and then we can produce uh, individual. Uh, exactly 100% is uh, this uh, donor uh, genetic. So the last uh, method uh, that we can we, we propose to establish in Indonesia. So now we are in the process to develop the biobank uh, laboratory uh, in our uh, faculty, uh, and. At the moment, we we got um, uh, a funding uh, to work on the Sumatran rhinoceros. So hopefully, we can uh, do something uh, in order that we can preserve the genetic material for a long period of storage. Uh, hopefully, uh, sometime, uh, somewhere, so we can produce something in order that we can uh, keep this material, genetic material, uh, alive in the freezer, in the frozen uh, sample. So this is the plan uh, that we uh, will develop uh, by a bank for the Sumatran rhinoceros. Uh, we, we, are, uh, we already collect uh, sperm, and also we already work together with the Malaysian uh, fat uh, in Sabah, uh, try to do an ICSI. Unfortunately, it's not uh, successful. Hopefully, we can uh, do here in Indonesia, and we can uh, get uh, something from this uh, uh, program. So, according to the Sumatran rhinoceros, the fact that 
uh, most of the female in the captivity is more than 700 has a problem and the male that we 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 that we have it now they produce a sperm only in some uh, in a small number so we call it uh, oligospermia so that with high abnormality so this is the picture that we start to work together with the uh, german team IZW in Sabah, and then uh, we try to do uh, an EC. This is uh, my colleague, uh, Professor Arif Budiono. So he's, a, he's an expert of the uh, EC. So I think that's uh, something that uh, I can resume uh, from uh, the uh, topic that uh, the uh, organizing committee gave me to talk about. Thank you very much. Wonderful, Dr. Agil, right off the bat. It is 20 minutes. Uh, and thank you for your great presentation. Of course, I wrote some essential points here for me to recap because some of the species, endangered species, uh, facing challenges in their reproductive system. So yeah. we, we as humans should help them uh, and also secure their survival in existence in the planet. We can help uh, such as like artificial dissemination. We can do like in vitro fertilization, also intracytoplasmic injection, and also somatic cell nuclear transfers and the last frontier we have biobanks. So I also invite all the attendees, if you have any questions uh, for Dr. Agil, please right away send your questions in the chat box and we will recap it in the end of the sessions. All right, Dr. Agil, we will also move to the next speakers. We have here Professor Raden Wisnu Nurcahyo, the head of parasitology department, faculty of veterinary medicine, Universitas Gajah Mada. He has an outstanding career in the pathology topic. He is the chairman of the Indonesian Veterinary Parasitology Association, and he will deliver the topic entitled Parasites, Zoonosis, and Wildlife as an Emerging Issues. Right off the bat, the zoonosis obviously vital issues during these days and can't wait to gain the insight from you, Professor. All right, Professor Wisnu, are you here with us? Okay, yes. All right, Professor Wisnu, thank you so much for being here with us. Uh, okay. You can share, you may share your screen and just in case I did a mistake in your introduction, please be comfortable to add your introduction, Professor Wisnu. <laughs> okay. All right. Since okay. your mic and video is great and presentation is working and we thought good to do, 20 minutes in this stage okay. now is yours. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for your introduction. This a great introduction there yeah, for me. Uh, so, hello everybody. Uh, Pak Agil, Pak Munawar, uh, Susan, and Steve. Uh, uh, now we come to the parasite and pathogen and zoonosis and wildlife as uh, emerging issues in Indonesia. So I have uh, uh, divided into uh, five uh, sessions uh, for my talks uh, about the introduction of the uh, zoonotic uh, disease, uh, ecology, and uh, our uh, wildlife research. Uh, uh, for today, I work only in uh, mainly in, 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 in orangutan in primate and also an elephant so not uh, so many uh, uh, wildlife animal and we uh, did together with uh, Dr. Ivona Voitova from Masaryk University uh, Czech Republic and also uh, uh, Professor uh, Johan Misho from uh, Leeds uh, University in Belgium so and then we uh, collaborate together uh, using by using uh, many uh, kind of the approach. Uh, for instance, uh, one health approach. Yeah, uh, how uh, to identify the pathogen in the field. So we have actually the problem in Indonesia that uh, Indonesia is a mega biodiversity. Uh, as I mentioned of the speakers before, that uh, we have uh, a lot of uh, problem, yeah, uh, like uh, uh, from the uh, coming from uh, uh, trading, commercial, uh, 
uh, farming for the uh, cattle uh, transmigration program in Indonesia, illegal logging, uh, forest fire, mining, uh, hunting, poisoning, uh, trade, social, political problem, uh, monetary crisis, law enforcement, land conversion, flood infrastructure, and finally, only the small, small uh, point of view is about the uh, disease. So, so one of the disease that uh, we want to talk about uh, now is the disease that uh, more uh, become important in the relation with the human and, and the uh, livestock is the, uh, we call it a zoonosis. Uh, so zoonosis uh, refers to the disease that passed between people and animals. And uh, recently, uh, researchers have determined that uh, more than 70% of the emerging infectious disease in people actually coming from animals. So, and uh, we identified so many uh, pathogens in Indonesia, uh, mainly in the parasite. So, because the parasite is a very, very a very important problem in the wildlife and pet animal and also livestock in Indonesia. Indonesia as a, a tropical country, so uh, the the parasite uh, look like uh, find the uh, paradise in tropical country like Indonesia. So examples of the zoonosis disease. Uh, uh, we know about uh, like uh, many viral uh, hemorrhagic fevers, uh, uh, respirat respiratory uh, disease uh, like SARS, and also uh, primate uh, malaria, Plasmodium nolesi, and many other parasite, parasitic disease uh, through the waterborne, vectorborne, uh, foodborne zoonosis disease. So, and the zoonosis is any disease or infection that's uh, naturally transmissible uh, from fetal bed animals to human. And uh, now we found that uh, there are three actors uh, that as a uh, diverse or uh, a spread of the uh, zoonotic disease. The first is about the uh, intermediate host like snail. And the second one is reservoir host. Uh, like uh, rodent, uh, right, uh, mouse, yeah. And then uh, the third is about factor, uh, like mosquito, flies, uh, uh, mites, uh, any other uh, factor of the uh, 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 the disease. Yeah. And around 1,415 pathogens in human, 868, around 61 is uh, zoonosis. So this is just is uh, uh, quite uh, interesting, yeah. And actually, uh, the origin of the zoonotic disease is uh, not coming from the uh, pet animal, from, but actually because of the human activity, yeah. In the past, uh, the wildlife lives uh, more in the habitat, in the forest, yeah, like in uh, outside of the Java Island. So in Sumatra, Kalimantan, so many things, uh, many uh, forests outside the Java. And uh, in the forest uh, lives uh, many wildlife. And, and then after that, the people coming uh, uh, from Java, uh, transmigration to open the uh, plantation, open the, the uh, 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 like uh, uh, a mining, yeah, to open and a big issue is about the new capital of Indonesia. It's also the problem uh, later, yeah, because there is uh, more contact between uh, wildlife, uh, pet animal, uh, livestock, and human. And uh, the diver is the 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 ectoparasites yeah? like uh, flies, uh, mosquito, uh, ticks, mite, yeah? and other uh, kind of the factors. So. And actually, uh, many experts that already uh, detect the uh, disease yeah, and control to reduce the incidence uh, in the uh, people and also in animals, but uh, still have the limitation because of many problems uh, uh, 
uh, face to the uh, problem in the field, problem in the uh, financial, problem with the capacity building of the people. So that's why uh, we cannot easily uh, control the uh, disease. Uh, and we now also uh, remember that the Indonesia is uh, now uh, there's many problems with uh, highly climate change, uh, variation of the weather, like now, the, the climate is a uh, 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 little bit change, and also the high density human population, change of agriculture, land use, housing, and livestock, and also and uh, biodiversity, flora, and fauna uh, are threatened. And, and this place uh, ideal location for emerging and be emerging infectious disease so, and uh, in many uh, city in indonesia we uh, saw uh, many attraction many uh, uh, people that uh, uh, have uh, uh, wildlife as a pet animals so this is the the reality in our uh, community so this is about the uh, pathogen of the wildlife, yeah? uh, uh, mainly uh, uh, about the uh, parasitic disease so from domestic animal and to the people and also the driver of the interaction. And from the parasite cells, uh, we found uh, many parasite, kind of parasite in the wildlife from protozoa, trematoda, cestoda, uh, nematoda, and also ectoparasite. So, and uh, we think that uh, through the habitat fragmentation will change the biodiversity vegetation and decline and also decrease the habitat area, uh, more contact with the human, contact with animal and livestock. Yeah. So change also their uh, animal feed, uh, limitation, their migration, home ring, and uh, on the other hand, is emerging the parasite and factor that this is the increasing of the parasite infection uh, risk for human and uh, animal. So, uh, what was we done uh, in the past 20 years? Uh, we developed suitable uh, methodology uh, how to obtain info and samples for, for, from in situ documentation and developing the strategy how to keep samples for later and future successful uh, processing because um, uh, many samples coming from the uh, wild animals, wild uh, life in, in the forest. And list of the parasite, uh, mainly in orangutan, elephant, and other uh, mammalia in wild, semi-wild. Uh, and also a uh, feeding list of orangutan when affected uh, by parasitology disease and when not. Uh, and also we creating methodology sharing info uh, with uh, our students. So we identify the rest of parasite species, parasite prevalence, respond with uh, other wildlife. Yeah. Uh, also include their self-medication strategy. Uh, for example, the, they use particular plant uh, with medicinal property to treat the parasitic disease. Uh, and also we study diversity, evolution across species yeah? and we testing also selected plants for anti-parasite uh, activities. So many uh, parasites that we uh, collect from the forest and the red uh, uh, the red is uh, the, the, the zoonosis disease, uh, disease like uh, in protozoa is balantidium coli and tamuba, cryptosporidium, uh, trichomonas, uh, plasmodium nolesi, and the and so on. And also in the other worm, uh, like nematodes, strongyloides, ascaris, uh, tricuris, esophagus tomum, uh, enterobius, uh, and also we found the new one, the dirofilaria uh, pongoi. So we identified also the the parasite, the new parasite, the mamonogamus larynius, like uh, also the pongobius Ukoti, Ukoti in, 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 in orangutan, and also uh, the old uh, parasite is uh, Ascaris uh, in human and in uh, livestock animal. Yeah? Also, Pertiella satiri. Uh, this is the parasite that's very common in the zoo, uh, Palantidium, Entamuba, Tricuris, Strongyloides, Osophagus tomum, and Enterobinae. So, we identified also the uh, 
protozoa according to the, the, the genus species yeah, in two place in uh, Ketambe in Bukit Lawang and North Sumatra and Aceh and also nematoda uh, what kind of the uh, kind of nematoda and also we uh, identify according to the sex uh, behavior also the age uh, from the uh, orangutan so mainly we found uh, uh, Landidium coli yeah, like uh, 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 like a uh, uh, protozoa yeah, in the uh, uh, gastrointestine of the uh, primate. So this is also the same, the uh, similar, but uh, in the uh, nematode and also uh, other uh, parasite. Yeah. So we identified also uh, the correlation with, with parasite and the feeding behavior of the orangutan uh, that they eat. Uh, some leaves, some fruit from the forest, yeah? and we identified according to the name of the local name and what is the uh, property inside. So, uh, interestingly, uh, in uh, central Kalimantan, we found uh, many cases of uh, strong eloides uh, according to the place in uh, National Park in Sebango, in Puting, Tanjung Puting, and also in Care Center and other place, and also uh, interesting. Uh, any uh, many contact with the uh, uh, wildlife and with the livestock, also with a uh, human. Uh, also, we identify that uh, the species that can uh, infect to the the, the kids yeah, in Central uh, Kalimantan. So, what is the important thing in orangutan is the Balandidium coli uh, because Balandidium coli is very pathogen in the at the zoo or in the rehabilitation center, but it's normal. Normal uh, parasites, uh, protozoa in uh, wildlife, in, in, in the wild, yeah, orangutan in the wild, it's normal. Yeah. Uh, this is the, the very unique uh, uh, fi finding. So, uh, tapeworm in orangutan, like uh, uh, anoplocephalid tapeworms, uh, and also cryptosporidium, this is uh, zoonotic, Enterocytosoan, Encephalitosoan, Giardia intestinalis, uh, we found also in uh, uh, captive uh, semi-wild uh, uh, orangutan. So what is the interesting parasite is uh, Plasmodium nolesi, uh, mainly in the uh, many uh, uh, primate like uh, Presbytis melalopos and Macaca fascicularis, Macaca nemestrina, and also in Pongo pygmaeus. So, so malaria actually is very common in in the in the animal, but uh, in the primate malaria we found um, many kind of the uh, uh, kind of the malaria. Uh, some of them is not uh, uh, not zoonotic, uh, but only uh, uh, small species is zoonotic. So. Uh, uh, there are uh, four main species plasmodium, uh, uh, falciparum, vivac, plasmodium malaria, and ovale. So the, the factor is the genus from Anopheles. Uh, this is the life cycle of the malaria through the uh, ana, Anopheles uh, latens, balabensis, uh, uh, the, the factor in malaria. This is the life cycle and also the, the, the the development of the uh, stadium of the plasmodium nolesi and comparing with uh, plasmodium nolesi. And the cases of the malaria in orangutan is uh, still in the question because uh, uh, we still uh, collect uh, the data and uh, find the uh, find the suitable method. So, uh, but we have. Uh, our colleagues have found in Aceh, in North Sumatra, there is an outbreak of Plasmodium nolesi uh, in 2018 in district uh, uh, West Aceh and also uh, uh, in Sabang. So, and this uh, malaria has a potential, big potential zoonotic uh, because uh, many people uh, changes the behavior of people who are especially often associated with the wildlife or being in the forest and increase interest in the nature tourism in the forest and adaptability of parasite and factors and also availability of suitable factor. So, so the, this is the uh, 
uh, picture about the, uh, the number from time to time is increased and uh, we have uh, a number of the cases in the, in the forest but not uh, well documented. So, so interaction in the factor uh, with the factor and the uh, uh, primate in the field. Uh, also the possibility uh, Anopheles Lecovirus group in the whole uh, Indonesia uh, because the climate is very good. good. And we develop also the uh, diagnosa uh, uh, for the malaria. So this is the factor that contribute the parasite load uh, according to health, nutrition, age, weight, uh, immune status, yeah, and many other things, many other factor and another uh, small finding in Sumatra elephant we found also. Uh, some pathogen, uh, not only uh, EEHV, uh, uh, elephant endotheolytic herpes virus. Uh, we uh, found also tuberculosis and uh, other parasite. This is a parasite in uh, is very common in the in the elephant in in the field. So uh, after the warming, uh, uh, come out uh, so many uh, nematode from in the feces, and we identify also. In six, uh, in six uh, Sumatra Elephant Conservation Center, collection the sample from the uh, centers, and we identify to the uh, 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 co uh, conventional and also molecular technique to identify the parasite, uh, nematode, and also uh, trematode. And the the important thing is about the the, the finding of the Trypanosoma, Trypanosoma elephanti in Y Cambas. Uh, in the Southeast Asia, Trypanosoma elephanti is, uh, is already zoonotic disease. And in, uh, in Baikambas, uh, the infection is coming from the, uh, the uh, uh, livestock, yeah? like cattle in Buffalo, through the ectoparasite, through the flies, yeah? biting flies, yeah? like muska, uh, stomoxis, chrysop, tabani flies. Uh, and we identified the blood also, and we identify also the uh, from blood uh, smear, uh, from blood parasite, uh, from the uh, cattle and buffalo. And we uh, together working together with uh, Facebook, yeah, to identify the uh, the pathogen in the field. Yeah, also. Uh, found uh, some interesting cases like tuberculosis in North Sumatra and in the, uh, in the uh, in elephant endotheliotropic herpes virus. So, so many things that we have to uh, using uh, one health approach, yeah, a concept that takes uh, into the account the relation received among uh, human health, animal health, and environment. So uh, this uh, approach, I think, is, is very imp important in Indonesia because uh, some of the uh, cases is underreporting yeah, of the zoonotic disease yeah, because of uh, inability, uh, the people, of the uh, customer, the uh, veterinarian to identify the pathogen, uh, uh, sometimes unwillingness, yeah, negative consequence, lack of compensation, time consuming, unpleasant, yeah, lack of feedback or respond. Yeah. So uh, this is the problem that uh, the, the pathogen, the zoonotic uh, uh, disease coming from wildlife is not so uh, popular. Uh, in maybe uh, this is the uh, important thing for the Ministry of the uh, Forestry uh, because uh, we have uh, to collaborate between the uh, veterinary sector and human health sector, and also the authority uh, in the in the in the forest yeah, uh, ministry of uh, forestry. So, uh, professor, I'm sorry, yes. professor. Uh, I think we have two minutes left for. The okay, yeah, purposes. this is conclusion. So, yeah, all right, so all right, right. disease is still important problem, and we use uh, one health approach to uh, include the relationship with human wildlife pathogen. And now we face uh, the climate change, globalization, trade, migration, uh, and uh, we need the synergy uh, between university, research center, industry uh, to achieve the solution. 
the key information for the parasitic disease risk assessment, uh, like a monitoring, mobilizing adequate response, diagnostic vaccine, antiparasite, clinical education, and community empowerment. Thank you very much for your attention. We collaborate with many parks, uh, including also uh, Dr. Steve Unwin uh, through the OFAC. Uh, we collaborate a long time uh, for the education for the my student. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah. All right, Professor, amazing. That is a great presentation. Certainly, I would essential points here for me to recap. Um, we have a multi-dimensional problem in the forest that makes uh, Indonesia is a high have an ideal location to emerge a zone of diseases and the research on the topic to detect to, uh, early uh, parasites in the animals could prevent another outbreak. So this uh, emphasize uh, the research in the sessions, we should be careful about the wildlife because you know, we, uh, without any further research, so the wildlife could bring us into another outbreak like this coronavirus. Right, Dr. Professor? All right. Okay, Professor, since the Professor Wisnu have another agenda at war, probably the Professor Wisnu cannot accompany us until the end of the agenda. Right, Professor? Yes, I will uh, until 4 o'clock. Yeah. All right, thank you so much, Professor. We will deliver the questions right into your emails if there are any questions from the audiences. And uh, have a good day, Professor. All right, after Professor Wisnu, we have the next speaker. We have Mr. Munawir MSG here. And Mr. Munawir, currently the head of Halimun Salak National Park and established a Japan Hawk Eagle Rehabilitation Center Sanctuary. He has a plenty of international events. He joined the 18th meeting of Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species of Flora and Fauna in the Genoa, delegating Indonesia at the moment in the event. It has happened in 2019. All right, Pak Munawir, are you here with us? Yes. Mr. Anos. All right, just in case, Mr. Munawir, I did a mistake in my intro. Please just be comfortable to add some of your introductions. So, seems your mic and also video is great. You can share your presentation now, if, it, if possible. Okay, thank you. With you, did you know, the stage is short, 20 minutes, but Munawir, thank you so much. <laughs> okay, allow me to share my presentation, please. Okay, share. Okay, can you see my presentation, Mr. Alus? Yeah, yes, yes, yes. I can see the presentation and you can press uh, F5 to present in the presentation mode. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, honorable to all speakers and also participants of uh, WACMIT Symposium 2021, wherever you are. Uh, first, I want to thank you to the WECMIC committee for this uh, opportunity to me to share the, our information, uh, experience, and also our achievement at the Japan Hawk Eagle Sanctuary Center, one of the ex situ conservation institutions in Indonesia. Uh, today, I will present on rehabilitation of Japan Hawk Eagle, Misetus Bakhtelsi, at the Japan Hawk Eagle Century Center in uh, Alimun Salak. Okay, uh, based on the data of Indonesia 2007, that uh, in Indonesia uh, there are three family, uh, 70 family of three, uh, 70 species of uh, three family raptors in Indonesia. According to the uh, professor Prawira Dilaga in 2001, uh, found that uh, in Gunung Halimun Salak, DS SNMP, Gunung Halimun Salak National Park, there are 17 uh, species of two family raptor in uh, Halimun, living in Halimun Salak. The family is uh, ACP 3 day uh, has 17 uh, species. One of them is uh, Japan Hawk Eagle, uh, Nisetus Bartelsi, or Komor, I would call Lang Jawa, 
And the second uh, family is uh, Falconidae, has uh, two uh, species. Uh, I, will, I would like to highlight uh, three primary points about Japan hawk eagle in Gunung Halimun Salak uh, National Park. Pardon, uh, Mr. Munawir, pardon. Uh, uh, can you make it into full screen mode? I'm sorry. Okay, sorry, sorry. All right, thank you so okay. much, Mr. Munawir. Go on. Okay. Okay. So I, I would like to highlight uh, three primary points about Japan. Don't say. Sorry. Hello, I still in link. But yes, 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 Mr. Munawir. But your presentation is. I kind of have a glitch. So have some Hello? errors. You can reshare it again if the full screen made the presentation error you just made it into small screen that's okay share again okay try to reset again if it's not possible so comedy will help to present your uh presentation yeah all right it's good all right okay now. okay okay we can say it now okay sorry uh, in this slide, I would like to highlight three primary points about Japan Hub Eagle in Gunung Halimun Salak National Park. First, about important value. Japan Hub Eagle, uh, protected by Indonesian law, uh, number five, 1990. And also, Japan Hub Eagle uh, lives in uh, Appendix to Citus, Endangered Species in IUCN Red Lights, and also as National Symbol one of 32 Indonesia endangered animal and also as top predator in the food chain and also maintain the balance of uh, the ecosystem. And very important thing for Gunung Halimun Salak, this species as conservation uh, priority in Gunung Halimun Salak National Park. Uh, the second uh, thing is about uh, the habitat and also population of Japan hawk eagle in Gunung Halimun Salak. Uh, uh, in general, uh, the Japan hawk eagle can live in primary forest, secondary forest, forest edge, pine forest, and even in agriculture and also plantation land. Uh, generally, we can find this species at height 600 until 1,800 uh, meter uh, above uh, sea level. Uh, in 2020, uh, we conduct a uh, study uh, about the uh, suitability habitat for the for this species. Uh, the result of study is uh, 41,000 uh, hectare or 47 uh, percent of the total area of uh, Halim Salak National Park, uh, 87,000 uh, hectare uh, suitability for this uh, species. And based on our monitoring, regularly monitoring every year, we calculate uh, the estimate of this population, this species is around 34 individuals. Uh, the, uh, the third uh, about uh, this point is threat. Uh, there are two uh, common uh, threats about uh, this species. Uh, such as uh, illegal poaching for uh, trade, illegal trade, and also uh, habitat loss. In 2013, Ministry of Forestry issued the regulation on strategies and action plan for Japan hawk eagle conservation for the period 2013 until 2022. There are four uh, strategies for conservation the Japan hawk eagle. Uh, first, about law enforcement efforts. And the second thing, and the second one is about uh, public awareness or campaigns. And the third, about uh, strategy habitat ecosystem 
habitat of ecosystem improvement. Uh, and the fourth is uh, release to the nature. All these strategies uh, link to the uh, rehabilitation program. So that's why rehabilitation program uh, is very important to conserve the species Japan hawk eagle. Uh, the term of wildlife rehabilitation is uh, to restoring wild natural behavior and good health condition so that uh, the wildlife can be released into the wild and also can survive in nature and very important thing is can reproduce after uh, release. Uh, I will talk to history and location uh, Japan Hawk Eagle Sanctuary, GHE SG. Uh, in 2007, initiated by 12 institutions, uh, uh, including uh, government, uh, LIPI, NGO, and a private sector, uh, built a uh, Eagle Conservation and Education Center, uh, common we call PPKE, Pusat Pendidikan dan Konservasi Elang. This PPKE managed by uh, Suaka Elang Consortium. Uh, but in 2015, on, consider on consideration of several things, uh, the management, uh, Suaka, the management uh, PPKE hand over to the uh, government. In this case, uh, Gunung Halimusalak National Park Office, and subsequently uh, changed the name to Japan Hawk Eagle Sanctuary Center, or we call we call PSSAJ, Pusat Suaka Satwa Alam Jawa. Uh, the location uh, this uh, PSSAJ or GSAEC. Uh, is uh, within the national park, within the Halimun Sala uh, in Bogor Regency. Okay, this is our uh, vision and mission. So, GSACC uh, have a vision is become a center for research and rehabilitation uh, of mountain raptor on an international scale. Uh, I believe we can exceed our vision by carry out uh, four mission, uh, namely uh, carry out raptor conservation activities, uh, including rehabilitation, release, and monitoring. The second, uh, our mission is uh, improving human resource capacity, such as uh, campaigns, education, limited uh, nature tourism. And then optimizing raptor research and rehabilitation facilities and infrastructure. The last, our mission about, uh, we need to collaboration with various parties at national and international levels. Okay, uh, this is the rehabilitation process in Japan Hawk Eagle Sanctuary Center. First, we receive uh, the Japan Hawk Eagle, or uh, animal, uh, in general, uh, we receive from uh, government. In this case, uh, Natural Resources Conservation Office, or we call BKSDA, and also we receive from uh, public. If any, if any uh, individual uh, infected disease like uh, avian influenza or maybe Newcastle disease, we transfer to isolation gate. In isolation gate, our medical staff will give some treat until this uh, individual healthy. But for the uh, animal uh, in good condition, directly uh, we put to the quarantine uh, gate. In quarantine case, uh, we uh, conduct a monitor about uh, the health and also be, uh, behavior of uh, this uh, individual. Especially, we monitor about uh, eating, eating behavior. Uh, when, if any uh, individual uh, has like a physical disability, 
all age or also bad behavior, we transfer to display. This means uh, the species, this, this uh, individual cannot uh, release to the nature. Uh, also, sometimes we, we, we need to improve the ability of the, uh, the uh, individual for flying. So we have a flying training cage. Uh, so uh, the, the individual can uh, training, uh, flying and maneuver in this uh, cage. The next step after quarantine cake is a, a training cake. In this cake, uh, we provide some facility so the individual can uh, train him by self uh, for ability to hunting prey, good playing, uh, planning, uh, and also interaction with humans. Uh, in this case, uh, the individual, they uh, must afraid of humans. And the final uh, process, re process rehabilitation in GHECSG uh, is uh, released. Uh, in this uh, process, we conduct several activities uh, such as uh, habitat assessment, habituation, uh, release and also the important thing is about PASCA release uh, monitoring. Uh, based on our experience, in general, generally, uh, the rehabilitation of eagles uh, starting from being accepted until they are released takes an average of six to nine months. The length of rehabilitation time depend on depend on the condition of the animal when it was received. Okay, this slide uh, showing our experience in the last five years in rehabilitation and releasing. Uh, before I'm going to the graph, before I'm going to the graph, I would like to inform uh, you that not only Japan Hawk Eagle our rehabilitation in GHAC, but also we rehabilitation another uh, eagles such as uh, Chaniable Hawk Eagle or we call Brontok, Lam Brontok. We also uh, rehabilitate Oriental Honeybird Set or Sikap Madu, Crested Serpent Eagle or Olang Ular Bido, Black Eagle, Lang Hitam, and also a Black Kite, uh, Lang Paria. Uh, during period 2017 till 2021, uh, GHEC, Japan Hawk Eagle Sanctuary Center, uh, has received 61 individuals and successfully released 25 uh, individual, uh, six individual uh, transfer to the display cake. That means the six individual cannot uh, release to the nature, uh, and five individual dead. Okay, if you look this graph uh, chart, in 2070 we received uh, four uh, individual eagles and we success released uh, three three uh, individual. And in 2018, uh, we received 13 and released three individuals. 2019, we received two and we released uh, one. Okay, in 2020, we received the greatest amount of the animals in the period, which is 24 individuals. And we success released four individuals. In this year, 2021, is also our biggest achievement. We successfully released 14 individuals, four of them, four of them uh, is uh, Japan Hawk Eagles. Okay, this is uh, the location uh, only in 2021, uh, site release in Java Island. If you look this uh, uh, 
uh, slide, uh, almost all the uh, province in Java Island we have uh, used to release the uh, uh, animal, except Yogyakarta. And this one, all the picture is profile, the uh, profi profile, profile of the uh, eagle has been our uh, release in the uh, nature. Okay, uh, this is uh, our documentation, our documentation. In June, June 2021, uh, we successfully released uh, two individuals. One of them is Japan Hawk Eagle and one... Uh, <laughs> Okay, uh, sorry. In June 2021, we success released to individual one of the Japan Hawk Eagle, uh, released by Minister of Environment and Forestry and also Deputy Chairman of Commission for House of Representative. And August uh, 2021, also we success uh, released uh, two individual Japan Hawk Eagle and Chernobyl Hawk Eagle, and uh, released by uh, Vice District Region uh, Lumajang. Uh, still in 2021, also we uh, success released two individual Chernobyl Hawk Eagle on September, uh, released by Vice Minister uh, Environment and Forestry Republic Indonesia, Pak Alu uh, and November on November uh, 2021, also we successful release two individu in Bogor, West Java, released by uh, Bogor District Region. The final uh, this year, uh, we also success release one individu Japan Hawk Eagle in Lebak, Banten Province, uh, released by uh, Deputy Region of Lebak. Uh, so, last but not least, my conclusion about Japan Hawk Eagle uh, is uh, the ex situ conservation Japan Hawk Eagle Sanctuary Center poses a significant role in conservating and increasing the number of mountain crab tortoise population, especially Japan Hawk Eagle in Java Island and particularly in Gunung Halimun Salak. Okay, thank you. That's my presentation and thank you for your attention. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Wonderful, Mr. Munawir. Thank you for the great presentation right off the bat. You have 20 minutes right on time to spend to deliver your lectures. Of course, I wrote some essential point here for me to recap. And we see the Japan Hawk Eagle facing threat by human. So we need a strategy conserve, to conserve the eagle. Uh, and Mr. Munawir mentioned four key points. There is law enforcement report, public awareness and campaigns, habitat uh, rehabilitation, and also uh, really effort should be done to conserve the eagle species. Along with Mr. Munawir and Gunung Halimun Salak National Park, uh, Mr. Munawir and the team able to conserve and sustain the species of some eagle especially the Japan Hawk Eagle. Thank you, Mr. Moray, for the presentation. And please, attendees, send right away your questions to the chat box if you have any. And we will move into the next uh, speakers. All right. OK. Well, thank you, Mr. Moray, from the lectures. All right. So last but not least, stay tuned. And we have Dr. Susan Shane here. So uh, we saw her this morning, I thought, in Indonesia, we're moderating the abstract uh, presentations, and he will be back. She will be back here to present some of the lectures. So, Ms. Dr. Susan Shane is a teaching fellow in biological anthropology. She's the co-director of the Borneo Nature Foundation and also Borneo River Initiative for Nature Conservation and Community. 
So she carried out research in the South Asia since 1997 and Indonesia since 2002. That's quite long. It's quite long research <laughs> on this chain. So she's a leading long-term study of gibbon behavior, ecology and socio-ecology in the peat swamp forest, as well as the conducting a detailed study of gibbon population density and distribution across Indonesian Borneo. And she will deliver lectures entitled How Do Can Help Gibbon Conservation? All right, there, this season. Are you here with us now? Yes, I am. Hello. Good All afternoon. Right. Just in case I didn't mistake in my introduction, please just be comfortable to have your introduction, Dr. Susan. And since your mic and video is working, without further ado, 20 minutes, the stage now is yours. You can start your presentation now. Thank you very much. Okay, I hope everybody can see this. So, I am presenting uh, with another hat on with, with my IUCN uh, primates specialist group section on small apes, um, which is sort of bringing together everything that we know about gibbon conservation, wild rescue centers and zoos, but I'm going to focus on zoos. I am delighted to be a part of this conference. I've had colleagues presenting a little bit on gibbon trade and on uh, wildcat conservation and chairing the session this morning. It's been wonderful to be a part of this. So let's just get my timer so that I stick to time. There we go. So the section on small apes was set up 2015 as a counterpart to the IUCN primate specialist group section on great apes, which of course includes uh, gorillas, bonobos, chimpanzees, and orangutans. And it was felt that there needed to be better strengthening of coordination among gibbon conservation projects around the world. As I said, rescue centers, sanctuaries, zoos, and of course, wild. That we needed to increase awareness of scientifically sound practice in gibbon conservation provide IUCN endorsed guidelines, for example, guidelines on rehabilitation and reintroduction, guidelines on surveying, new guidelines coming out on ecotourism, to conservationists, people working in the field and decision makers. We also need to develop action plans which clarify the priorities in gibbon conservation and uh, Perhapi, the, the Indonesian Primate Society is working on an Indonesian gibbon action plan for all Indonesian Gibbon species that helps also make decisions for practitioners, again, the decision makers, but also the people providing funding. And of course, we have to endorse and ensure that the IUCN Red List of Threatened Species as a decision tool and a funding tool is thorough and up to date. And of course, provide direct technical support to implementing projects engaged with Gibbon conservation. And all of this is an area where zoos can help. They, as we have seen today, can provide not just funding, but expertise, husbandry information, they can share information, and of course, more projects working in situ can share information with ex situ. So we know that we have 20 species of gibbons recognized in the wild in 11 countries, five are critically endangered, 14 endangered, and one vulnerable. Indonesia has the most spe gibbon species of any country with nine, all of which are classified on the IUCN red, red list as endangered. But when it comes to zoos, at least three species have absolutely no captive breeding. These are all uh, species of gibbons found in, well, Hainan gibbon in, in, on Hainan, Hainan Island in um, China, Calvit gibbon, which is found in, in China and Vietnam, and the Skywalker gibbon, which is found in China and probably uh, in Myanmar. So that does mean that we've got really only 17 species of whom there are potential breeding groups in captivity. And of course, I'm talking about, you know, zoos across the world. So we do have to think about, as we've heard earlier, about viable population sizes. Yes, okay, you may have a gib five, five animals of one species in two zoos, but that's not a viable population size in captivity should these animals need to go back to the wild. So we have to think about the captive population carefully. This is a nice little infographic just showing 
a little bit the uh, visually the differences between the gibbons because as I'll talk about with with the pet trade it is sometimes quite difficult to identify a gibbon species especially when they are very young so the online trade and uh, Dr. Radin mentioned wildlife trade uh, in his presentation and we've been focusing looking on this maybe now for the last sort of three years and looking at online trade, and it does appear that Facebook and Instagram, certainly in, in Indonesia, are the biggest culprits in terms of facilitating the illegal online sale of gibbons, and of course many other species, but I am going to focus on gibbons. And some of the key words that we've identified, you can see here in, in italics, gibbon, siamang, unco, unco with a k, wa, monyet, dual bli, um, quite often um, boneca comes up and there's a lot of activity. Now, of course, Indonesia is a very, very big place with a lot of people who have access to the internet. And along with Gibbonesia, we've done a bit of an investigation into where the majority of this, this trade is happening. And you can see density of trade in Gibbon, uh, Gibbon of trade of, sorry, density of trade accounts by province specifically relating to Gibbons. And you can see in red we are the highest, more than 21, medium about 11 to 20, and this is uh, per month, and uh, low or uh, in blue and absent in, in gray. And this again is just for Indonesia. So we're seeing very high um, prevalence of trade in Gibbons across pretty much all of Java and a large part of Sumatra with the exception of um, Aceh. So this is certainly interesting in terms of understanding where the trade is happening. But of course, we have to think about what is being traded. And the interesting thing with this is that all of the gibbons that have been identified through this, through this work, they're all Indonesian species. So it's likely that this trade is happening within Indonesia rather than gibbons coming from, say, Malaysia, for example. And this has an interesting knock-on effect when it comes to how zoos can assist. So a lot of international funding focuses on international trade, international illegal wildlife trade, which is, of course, a problem. But international trade starts with domestic trade, but it's not considered as exciting a thing to fund um, as, 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 in, as dealing with international trade. But of course, if you do not stop domestic trade, it becomes international. And this is where zoos have a big role to play because they can help fund these smaller projects that will focus on domestic trade of um, uh, illegal wildlife. But understanding why people are buying gibbons, understanding where the gibbons are coming from, understanding who's selling them, and of course then linking back to how rescue centers can help receive these gibbons and, and perform hopefully rehabilitation is a, is a big problem. And again, we know that many of these rescue centers are highly dependent on funding from zoos and indeed sharing expertise with zoos both ways, rescue centers sharing with zoos and zoos sharing with rescue centers. So this is a huge problem because 90% of the gibbons that are found across these social media posts are less than three years old. I would say actually the majority are probably less than even one, which does make it challenging to identify the species in some cases. It also means that you're going to have a lot more potential husbandry and welfare issues when that animal is taken to a rescue center. And again, this is where vets and, and working with zoos can really help share their expertise of how to deal with a very young gibbon. Zoos can help raise awareness and channel resources to deal with this issue. Much, much of the time, people may not be aware that you know, everyone's using Facebook to stay in touch with friends and family or Instagram to share your news. Do you realize that these, these platforms are facilitating illegal trade of endangered Indonesian protected species? But at the moment, certainly at least for the case of gibbons, probably orangutans as well, there are so many animals 
already in the pet trade needing rescuing and rehabilitation, that it's probably not helpful to return animals from zoos, especially not zoos outside of Indonesia, to Indonesia for, for return to the wild. There are enough animals in the pet trade that need help first. It's not a good use of resources to do that. So thinking about ways again that um, rescue centers and zoos can, can collaborate. Well, one of the ways of course is there are probably more gibbons in the pet trade than there are spaces in rescue centers. So rescue centers need help and funding and expertise to expand to find suitable habitat to return gibbons back to the wild, to follow gibbons after release, post-release monitoring. We must ensure that animals are not simply released without follow-up. We have to follow them to determine success and of course intervene if there are any problems with the animals being returned. And again, with um, 2014, we held a workshop um, in Cambodia, where we had experts from, I think, pretty much every country where there is a given rehabilitation center, and of course, experts from Indonesia, who came together to put their knowledge together for these IUCN agreed best practice guidelines. Um, Steve uh, slightly mentioned it earlier, but certainly when, when it comes to the European Association of Zoos and Aquaria, and I think even it is a World Association of Zoos and Aquaria criteria that all ex situ institutions should have a tangible link to in situ conservation through, through funding, through sharing knowledge, through, when possible, staff exchanges, through education and outreach. And again, working together to create standard husbandry, breeding and welfare guidelines, not just for gibbons, but for all species in captivity. Um, one of the things, again, that we've done with, with the SSA and, and OVAG, the Orangutan Vet Advisory Group, um, since 2017, is actually bring Gibbon rescue centres, both the vets and the managers, on board to share their knowledge, to learn from the vets working on orangutans. Some of the skills and, and challenges are similar, some are quite different. We have now got a coordinated vet forum for Gibbon projects not just Indonesia, but including every con most countries where we have um, gibbon projects where gibbons are found. And again, we're hoping to work to, to, to continue to work with, with the orangutan vet advisory group to continue to bring vets to these meetings. Obviously, the last two years, the meetings have been online. I hope next year we can all get back together again in, uh, in Indonesia in person. And one of the actions has been, and even before COVID-19, was to tackle emerging diseases in wild and captive gibbons and sea amounts, to try to understand more about, and again, we've had presentations today about parasites and gibbons. How can that help? What more can we learn in terms of you understanding emerging diseases, viruses, parasites, bacteria in wild and captive gibbons and sea amounts to improve protection in the wild and conservation and improve welfare uh, and husbandry in captivity. As I said, it's, this is the, one of the, the missions of the SSA is to ensure that this meeting is regularly attended to ensure maximum knowledge exchange for, for Gibbon vets. And I know that there is an active group um, on email and, and WhatsApp to share knowledge and, and have a, a quick access to people's expertise should there be a problem. As I said, we've, uh, over the last few years, we've had 15 vets from uh, seven, seven Habitat countries attend so far, plus managers and, and various other experts. One of the other things zoos can be really helpful, obviously the pandemic has, has hit this hard because they cannot, could not have visitors, but International Gibbon Day. So this happens every year on the 24th of I didn't include the date, that was very silly. It's on the 24th of October every year. Um, and we started this again in 2015. Um, there's a, uh, we've got a, a professionally designed logo and various other promotional materials, which are all free on the website. Uh, in 2021, even though 
people couldn't travel and pandemic problems. There were 12 live events in seven different countries, plus an enormous amount of engagement across social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram in multiple languages. And I know many of the organizations in Indonesia working with Gibbons were super active um, in promoting what they're doing. But we had, we had events um, in, in the UK, in Indonesia, Malaysia, Bangladesh, China, Vietnam, India. Uh, so it's very exciting to have, to have so much happening. Thinking about husbandry, again, husbandry manuals are regularly going to be needing to be updated. Um, the more we learn, the more we have to know. These have to be um, ongoing documents that, that require constant updating. We had hoped to have the third International Gibbon Husbandry and Conservation Conference last year. Uh, for obvious reasons, that didn't happen. It's being rescheduled we hope for Hanoi in Vietnam in September 2022. So if you know of anyone who might be interested in participating in this, we hope it will all be face to face, uh, please let me know. And we are working as well um, to try and really, the biggest bar language barrier is, is generally with China. And we are trying again to work with the Chinese zoo community to help them work with uh, husbandry, husbandry guidelines that have been created by IASA uh, and ensure that they implement these. We're also working on a best practice guidelines for um, health and disease monitoring, which I hope can come out middle of, middle of next year. And again, these are not supposed to be dense academic documents. They're meant to be documents that people in the field, people in rescue centers can go to to get help. A lot of this, and again, it comes back to the zoo. Zoos have such an, an enormous outreach because they get so many visitors. As Steve mentioned in his presentation earlier, the amount of money contributed by zoos annually is one of the third biggest in, 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 in the world. And much of that money comes because the general public goes to the zoo with their family. So that potential of zoos to be able to reach the general public with the message, not, not always negative messages, of course, that, that discourages people, but a positive message, but also sharing news about the projects that they work with in the field. So that somebody who goes to a zoo um, in France, for example, can learn about the work that we at Borneo Nature Foundation are doing on the other side of the planet. It's in the right language, it's in French, but it's using the information collected by Borneo Nature Foundation. So it's accurate science for good conservation and good outreach and education. And part of that is all the different social media. Um, to try and engage with as wide an audience as possible. So zoos really do have quite a large role to potentially play. So some of the things that zoos can think about doing is again, helping people understand about the online trade and focus their efforts to help rescue centers deal with the volume of trade in situ. Um, sharing their experience and ideas. So for example, husbandry guidelines, going to these conferences, contributing to best practice guidelines. And some zoos, of course, either online or in person, have uh, sent their vets to uh, the Gibbon sessions at the Orangutan Vet Advisory Group meetings. Because again, it's sharing knowledge and expertise. A vet from the UK may have a different experience probably will have a different experience from a vet working in a, in a rescue center in Indonesia. But those sharing of ideas is so important. Getting zoos to do something for International Gibbon Day, it doesn't have to be very much, but if they, if they have a gibbon, even just sharing on social media to highlight International Gibbon Day can be a positive thing. And zoos, of course, need to communicate not just with the field, but with each other. And that is starting to happen much more, which is fantastic. And so I would just like to put out a call. The SSA is always looking for more people to join our mailing list um, and participate in our activities. 
And if anyone needs to get involved or would like to get in touch, um, I have many email addresses, but they all basically come to the same place. But the one uh, for the, the section on small apes is section.small.apes at, at gmail.com. So if you have students working on Gibbons, you yourself work on with Gibbons, and you're not on the SSA email list, then please let me know. And with that, I think, again, I would just like to say a very big thank you to all of the organizers all the participants, thank you for listening and for inviting me. Um, I very much enjoyed all of the talks that, that I've been able to attend. And with that, I believe I'm done. Thank you. Wonderful, Dr. Susan Shiny. That was wonderful presentations. All right, so I want to recap some of the points that you delivered in the lecture. So uh, the IUCN Red List of Small Primates uh, Group is working to, uh, to make an action plan for all the small apes and also maintain the IUCN red list data, keep up to date and also provide a direct uh, technique, uh, uh, technical, what is that, guidance to implement the project to conserve uh, the small apes, especially given seen in Indonesia. So um, I see some heart wrenching issues here that is online trade of gibbons. I didn't know that it was that high. So uh, I see that zoos can help to raise awareness and also uh, what is that? To safeguard the resource to deal with the issues because the issues of the online trade is really interviewing. And the message that you delivered in the lectures, we have four key messages. First, we have to help to stop the online trade of gibbons. Second, we should share and share the idea uh, to stop this issue. And also think about uh, send a pet to the OPEC at the Orangutan Episodic Group. And I'm saying so. Do something with the International Gibbon Day. So for me, this is not, um, what is that? This is not a suggestion or an advice, but this is a must. It is an uh, obligation for all line of the practitioner of the conservation, especially in Gibbons. Thank you so much, Dr. Susan Chain from the Great Lectures. And now it's time for me to recap all the questions that happens all along the discussion in this afternoon. All right, let me check some of the questions here. So probably when we do the discussion, some of the attendees ask directly to the panelists, to the expert here, but uh, I see one question here unanswered that is directed to Mr. Munawir. Mr. Munawir, are you here? Mr. Munawir, yeah, are you here? Okay, Mr. Right, Mr. Munawir, okay. so we have one yeah. question for you here. So the question oh. is, even oh. From Sulis Trianto from Meru Betiri. All right, so I will oh. read the question for you. So, how many mm -hmm. individual individual of all of Japan hog eagle have been released in the forest? How to assess the successful of release? How many successful individuals that living until the end of the time or until now in term of percentage? Uh, you can answer it now, or whether you can answer it now, Mr. Munawir. Okay, yeah, I will. Right. Okay, thank you for Mr. Sulcianto. Uh, good question. Uh, Mr. Sulcianto, uh, based on our standard of procedure, SOP, uh, before we release the eagles, the individual, uh, we must to, uh, the individual, we put like some uh, wing marker. Yeah. Uh, we put a uh, wing marker. It's aimed to help us to monitor the individual easily. So uh, we do this manually, sorry, yeah. Until now, uh, the monitoring we do manually without advanced uh, technology such as uh, like a GPS technology. Uh, so that uh, we cannot uh, monitor the individual in a long period. Yeah, we cannot uh, monitor the individual in a long period of time until uh, they successfully reproduce in the nature. Uh, as for us, I know there is, uh, in my knowledge, uh, there is no uh, this kind of technology we can use for this purpose, but. Uh, in the new future, Mr. Sugianto, we will uh, uh, conduct uh, collaborative with uh, Kyoto University. 
to monitor the successfully released uh, the eagle, uh, the eagle uh, using a microchip. Uh, we hope until we collaborate, we can uh, uh, monitor uh, for the long time uh, the eagle uh, uh, we have successfully released. That's my answer. Thank you. Hey, all right, Mr. Malawira, thank you so much. And hopefully the the holistic answer from the Mr. Malawira can answer the questions from the uh, Pak Sulistrianto from the Nero Pichiri. So, okay, since there is there is no questions left, so I have one question to Dr. Susan Cheney because I ever work with the gibbons one. So we assess the habitat suitability of the gibbons and also we um, we want to count or calculate the population size of the gibbons alibarbis in uh, central Kalimantan. So I have one question here. So you mentioned that uh, the online trade of the gibbons is it happens uh, in Indonesia. So the interesting question is, do you find any underlying cause why people could buy gibbons in Indonesia? And also why people, is there any also gibbons trade outside Indonesia? Or what is the reason uh, is there any, what is that, the similarity between in the Indonesian reason with the, the other country reason why they buy Gibbons? Thank you, Dr. Susan. Gosh, good question. Um, absolutely, the trade is not only Indonesia, it's just that we have the most accurate information for Indonesia. Um, so we do know that it's not the trade is not only happening online, it's still happening in, in traditional markets. Uh, in Malaysia, it, it's a big problem for having gibbons as pets. In um, Vietnam and uh, Cambodia, Laos and parts of China, it's more common that the gibbons are hunted for meat or medicine and not to be kept as a pet. We don't really know what's happen happening in, in Myanmar. That, that is, of course, a very difficult country to work in at the moment. And even talking with colleagues in Myanmar, uh, they cannot get to the field because it is, it is not safe. Um, India, the problem seems to be animals end up accidentally, gibbons accidentally being kept as pets because of habitat fragmentation. So all the reasons are very different, which is why like you say, it's so important to understand why people are keeping gibbons as a pet. So when we compare it to people owning slow lorises, kukang, uh, a few years ago, it, it tended to be that people were buying adult kukang slow lorises, whereas people are buying baby gibbons. Now, an adult slow loris still looks sort of cute and is still quite small. Of course, a baby gibbon is cute and small, but then becomes big and gets big teeth and be can become aggressive. So we're not absolutely certain what the cultural reasons might be. I mean, I compare it to owning exotic pets in the UK. You know, this is unfortunately for some primate species, it's still legal to keep them as a pet in the UK. Many people are surprised by this, and I am very embarrassed by this. You know, the UK wants to really support stopping illegal wildlife trade, yet you can still have capuchins from South America, marmosets or um, tamarins from South America, or you can legally have these as pets. I think, I think there is a long history of people wanting what other people don't have. Like we all want the latest iPhone or the best car or an animal that shows, I think it is just, it's a status symbol. And it is also, it's not just that people are buying these animals online. Once they own them, they're then posting about them online. I've seen uh, an account of a woman who drives around Jakarta on her moped with the gibbon on her back. And she has so many followers because she is showing her owning a gibbon as a pet. So it's not just the sellers, it's, it's, a, it's very complicated and requires a lot of social science study. But I think it ultimately comes down to the fact that people 
don't know it's illegal. They don't realize that they're causing physical or mental harm to the animal because it's not living with its own kind. It's socially isolated and they want what other people can't have because as humans, we do like to show off. So it's a big problem to tackle. But I think like, like I said, when we have lots of problems, we have the opportunity to create many solutions. So yeah, I hope that answers your question. Yes, Dr. Susan, thank you for answering that. Thank Indeed, you. we need an anthropological view about these events because since the human hours, they are quite different. <laughs> so it's already important to tackle the issues for the gibbons, uh, hopefully or not. Extinct. So, all right, everyone. So since I have no question in the chat box and probably Dr. Agil is having some discussion with the, one of the, uh, one of the attendees. So that's quite good about talking about uh, Japan. Uh, Banding. So, all right, so this is a wrap up for this uh, afternoon discussions. After I check all questions, seems that all questions is answered. And till all honor speakers, I would like to deliver stones of gratitude that you can free your time here in the WACMIC 2021 agenda. And hopefully, this dissemination could spread out to the whole world and establish connection between the conservation enthusiasts an expert and share the same vision. And for me, as a moderator, I would like to send an apology if I did a mistake on my side and wrongfully introduce you to the sessions, I send my biggest apology. And see you on another occasion. And for the Master of Ceremony, Faiha, I give the stage back to you. Faiha, thank you so much. All right, thank you so much, Mr. Anus, for the amazing drive of our session. It has been a very interesting session. I'm sure the participants feel the same way either. I would also like to thank all of our distinguished speakers for your amazing presentations. You have given us abundance of insights regarding conservation mechanisms through ex situ conservation, how important and effective it is, the problems and challenges, and many more. Starting from the role, uh, maybe the role of Wildlife Rehabilitation Center by Dr. Steve, until the issue of wildlife trading through online courses and how zoos can contribute to the conservation uh, itself by our last speaker. So uh, as Mr. Anu said, we have reached our uh, end of the session. So uh, me as the MC would like to apologize as well if there's a lot of shortcomings coming from me. And ladies and gentlemen, by this, we have fully completed all five symposi symposiums of this year's WACMIC. We thank all of the participants. And after this, we still have an official closing session at 7 p.m. Uh, GMT plus seven time. We look forward to your attendance. Thank you so much and have a nice day. Indonesia is one of the largest archipelagic countries in the world, with more than 17,000 islands that spread over an area of more than 2 million kilometer squares. Indonesia is host to several unique ecosystems, containing a large number of diverse species. At least 10% of the world's flowering species, which counts to over 25,000 species, flourish in Indonesia. There are also 12% of the world's mammals, 16% of reptiles, 17% of birds, 6% of amphibians, and over 45% of fishes, all of which are parts of the nation slash biodiversity. In order to preserve its biodiversity, which also contributes hugely to the world, Indonesia has taken significant steps in accordance to the national and global target on biodiversity framework. The government has allocated more than 500 units of protected area spread throughout the country, with the total coverage area of 22 million hectares terrestrial and 20 million marine protected area. 
Because of its uniqueness and universal values, six protected areas are recognized as World Heritage Sites, 16 Biosphere Reserves, 7 Ramsar Sites, and 7 ASEAN Heritage Sites. Many studies and researches has also been conducted to identify plants and animals to assess their potential uses for medicine, food, energy, and biocontrol for a chemical hazard. Some community-driven activities such as ecotourism has also contributed to the effort to preserve Indonesia's biodiversity, which also encouraged cooperation among local stakeholders. The results are heartening. By 2019, Indonesia has been able to increase the population of endemic and priority species. Communities have also enjoyed benefits from this improved environment through ecotourism, environmental services, and other significant condition, which contribute to their quality of life as a whole. There is little doubt that Indonesia's vast biodiversity plays a hugely significant role in reducing the impacts of climate change. By preserving its biodiversity and its ecosystems, Indonesia can help support the entire planet's sustainability and ensure a better future for all humankind. Sejarah Fakultas Kehutanan UGM resmi didirikan pada tanggal 19 Desember 1949 dan merupakan universitas yang bersifat nasional. Selain itu, UGM juga berperan sebagai pengemban Pancasila dan sebagai universitas pembina di Indonesia. Pada saat didirikan, UGM hanya memiliki enam fakultas dan salah satu di antaranya adalah Fakultas Pertanian. Dalam perkembangan selanjutnya, melalui Surat Keputusan Menteri Perguruan Tinggi dan Ilmu Pengetahuan Nomor 99 tahun 1963, Fakultas Pertanian dan Kehutanan UGM terpisah menjadi tiga fakultas, yaitu Fakultas Pertanian, Fakultas Teknologi Pertanian, dan Fakultas Kehutanan. Dengan demikian, Fakultas Kehutanan UGM secara resmi dinyatakan berdiri pada tanggal 17 Agustus 1963. Dekan pertama Fakultas Kehutanan UGM adalah Profesor Insinyur Sudarwono Harjo Sudiro. Berdasarkan SK Direktur Jenderal Pendidikan Tinggi, SK Dirjen Dikti Nomor 163 tahun 2007 tentang pengaturan program studi dan surat keputusan rektor nomor 89 tahun 2010 tanggal 1 Februari 2010 mensahkan perubahan keempat program studi di Fakultas Kehutanan menjadi satu dengan nama program studi kehutanan program studi kehutanan terdiri dari empat bagian yaitu 1. Departemen Manajemen Hutan 2. Departemen Silvikultur 3. Departemen Teknologi Hasil Hutan dan 4. Departemen Konservasi Sumber Daya Hutan Di Fakultas Kehutanan terdapat Dewan Perwakilan Mahasiswa atau DPM yang berperan sebagai Badan Legislatif Mahasiswa dan Lembaga Eksekutif Mahasiswa atau LEM. Kemudian terdapat empat himpunan mahasiswa minat, diantaranya yaitu Keluarga Mahasiswa Manajemen Hutan atau KMMH, Himpunan Mahasiswa Budidaya atau Himaba, Family of Forest Product Technology atau Forest Tech, dan Family of Forest Conservation atau Forestation. Di samping itu, terdapat Badan Semi Otonom atau BSO yang meliputi Organisasi Pencinta Alam atau Mapala Silva Gama, Komunitas Seni Kehutanan atau KSK, Keluarga Mahasiswa Islam Kehutanan atau KMIK, dan Forestry Study Club atau FSC. Sedangkan International Forestry Student Association atau IFSA 
dan keluarga mahasiswa Kristen Kehutanan atau Bonita termasuk ke dalam non-BSO. FFI bekerja di Indonesia sejak tahun 1996 yaitu awalnya bersama dengan LIPI untuk melakukan penelitian-penelitian terutama penelitian terkait dengan harimau Sumatera kemudian berkembang, kemudian kita ada kerjasama dengan Kementerian Lingkungan Hidup dan Kehutanan waktu itu Kementerian Kehutanan terkait dengan pengelolaan spesies-spesies yang dilindungi Tantangan terbesarnya adalah kata kuncinya sebenarnya kepedulian. Ya, kata kuncinya adalah kepedulian. Kalau semua sudah peduli, maka secara umum sebenarnya pekerjaannya sudah dan. Tapi masalahnya itu, bagaimana kita mendorong semua pihak untuk peduli menyelamatkan planet kita ini bersama-sama. Itu tantangan yang paling besar. Kearifan lokal masyarakat juga sangat penting di sana. Jadi di lain pihak kita melihat ada ancaman, tapi di lain pihak juga kita melihat ada kearifan masyarakat untuk menjaga hutannya. Nah itu yang kita coba untuk dorong untuk dikembangkan. Planet kita ini yang sustain, sustaining the planet itu jangka panjang paling panjang kita. Jadi itu tujuan jangka panjang keberadaan MFI. Bukan hanya di Indonesia, tapi di dunia.